Justin, welcome to Mint. Thank you for being on. How are you doing? Doing very well. How about yourself? Feeling good, man. Living the dream. Let's dive right in, okay? I think a lot of the crypto community already knows who you are, so I want to skip that intro question for the most part. I want to dive right into how do you understand the current state of music NFTs? How are you thinking about that as where we are today? So I think there's really two ways to think about music and the intersection of anything that's Web3 related. Um, NFTs, like people use this phrase music NFTs very loosely. I think there's like three types of things to think about. There's the consumption of music itself because music is ultimately invisible. It's not like a PFP or like a piece of art. It's invisible. So there's the consumption, um, there's the ownership, and then there's the visual representation. And all of those things kind of can exist in a Web3 framework in different ways. Um, but the consumption and the collectability piece are distinct in that people probably don't consume music in the same way you consume a visual. When a visual is in your profile picture or in your wallet um, and you cast that to a screen, there's a more tangible experience in the ownership. Um, it's unlikely, in my humble opinion, that people are going to listen to music from their wallets. Um, I believe that they'll probably use streaming services like Audius or like Spotify to consume music, um, which is a bit different than the way all other types of NFTs exist and manifest today. So yeah, again, there's like the kind of three things to think about. There's the you know ownership, true ownership of the rights in a song. Um, that's what we do at Royal that we're excited about. There's the visual representation, um, which sometimes can be combined with like the collectability of audio, um, however that manifests. And then there's the consumption. So those are the three layers of thinking about music in Web3. Why are you so excited on the ownership layer? Why did you decide to position Royal as the ownership layer uh, for music in crypto? So there's pretty misdirect narrative surrounding like how meaningful music ownership actually is. Okay. A lot of artists have been disenfranchised from, you know, actually owning a large portion of their music. But when you do own your own music, um, there are significant monetary rewards slash cash flows that accrue over time. The best example I like to give of this is I have this song called Is It Love, which was the first song I independently released. Um, at the time, I had a record deal in place for, I believe it was 50% of the song for $15,000. And okay. that was in 2015. The song came out. I decided not to do that label deal for $15,000 for 50% of the song. And that song has since generated over $750,000 significant um not it's bad. actually not, not even on my most popular chart on spotify um i think people just like don't understand the flow of income in music and i'm actually publishing a blog post on like where money comes from and who takes what and why artists are left with so little um but in most cases when artists do own their own music there actually are real cash flows now in some cases they might feel insignificant um but there's a reason why private equity and like and hedge funds are plowing money into catalog and, and, and previous catalog mm -hmm. investments. Um, it's because there, the, you know, music as an asset class is interesting. Um, it, it's not quite the narrative that's portrayed in the public where like musicians don't make money. Um, that might be the case for some independent artists, but frankly, people might hate me for saying this, but like not everybody is going to have the most popular music. It's just impossible. Um, right. I don't, right? Um, but I'm still able, like there are lots of artists out there. Um, I think there's an artist named Suicide Boys that aren't signed to a label. They own all their own music. And I'm pretty sure they generate like a million a month from streams all independently wow. um, there's a lot of stories like that right so at royal like the narrative that like you don't make money from streams and there's all these comparisons about like collectible music nfts and how they they're valued differently from how streaming streaming is valued um i think it's kind of a weird comparison to make because when you collect a, a collectible music nft which i've actually never done in, in my career i've actually mm -hmm. never issued, i've never issued just a music nft by itself I never just tokenized a song. Um, when you just tokenize a song, I'm, I'm not really sure what it does. I'm not sure why it's interesting. Um, to me, owning a piece of the copyright is infinitely more interesting. And Bored Apes did this first, you know, for visual art. And I think that's why they've succeeded, why I participated in the initial mint of apes and why I was so excited about them. I think, you know, on the one hand, you have this, uh, on the collectible music side, you have another channel, another challenge, which is um, the clearances. So an independent artist can release collectible music and people might speculate on that value 
um, there's no enforceability to the scarcity the same way there is on the on the true ownership side, right? Like with true ownership, you can only sell 100% of something. So there's inherent scarcity. Um, whereas with music, because the consumption layer and the collectible layer are kind of analogous to each other and the consumption happens multiple times, um, there's no real way to protect against like the scarcity problem. I um, mean, a lot of music musicians have actually minted NFTs of the same song um, in the collectible world. So I find it quite interesting that like the scarcity isn't as inherent or obvious because music inherently is consumed in, as an invisible thing. Um, so that's another like kind of interesting fact on the collectible side. But on the clearance side, um, music collectibles can scale to independent artists who control their own work. But once there's another rights holder, you need to get their clearance if you're using the audio. What we do at Royal is none of our tokens actually point to the audio files at all. So when you buy an asset on Royal, you're buying ownership in the song from an IP standpoint. And you get visual art that represents that ownership so that you have something to show your friends. It's like the social signaling, emotional value, we still find is extremely important. So that's what we do at Royal. And, and part of the reason why we do that is because I went through a lot of stuff on the IP side after I did my auction, um, stuff that a lot of other collectible music platforms aren't even really thinking about because there's no precedent for it, right? And so a lot of the experience that I had informed the architecture of Royal, the asset architecture, and we're, we're excited because it's working, you know, we're excited because with Nas, you know, we had 200,000 people show up, you know, 60% of which had never used a wallet before um, to actually participate. And we think that that's like really key to onboarding the mainstream, um, especially because the mainstream doesn't really understand collectible music. When, you know, I say to someone, hey, you can own, you know, a song on I, like uh, an NFT that points to a song on I, IPFS, but you can also listen to that song on Spotify and um, Audius it's not quite the same as an image becoming more popular as more people see it. And there's one owner, you know, the same kind of value proposition of regular NFTs. It's, um, it's different. It's different because again, it's, it's invisible. So, you know, m my general thesis is in the long term, people will be interested in owning rights. And, and that's mainly because regardless of what the economics you, you think about today for, for a big artist or a small artist, um, if you bet on a Billie Eilish song, before it explodes, there's 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 real income there. It's really interesting. Um, let alone the appreciation of the of the uh, you know the asset value itself. So yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of unpacking to do there. I could talk about that for hours and hours. I'm trying to give yeah. as like quick of, yeah. a, of, of a brief as possible. Sure. No. So I I've been collecting music NFTs for the last few months. Uh, I haven't I haven't got the chance. The drops have sold out too fast on Royal for me <laughs> to be able to snag one. But I've been collecting other music NFTs across uh, Zora, across Sound, etc. And I think a lot of the narrative behind why people collect these collectibles, whether they're editions, whether they're one of ones, is because there's never been really the opportunity to value music for what it's worth as art. Right. Just like you were to value a piece of art within itself and you'd go to the museum and you want to place a bid or some type of gallery. There hasn't been a real way to value the art for the art within itself, the song within itself. Right. How do you think about that? Because that, that tends to be a lot of the commentary, a lot of the rationale yeah, behind collecting. The um, I actually think it's the combination of both that's the most powerful. So when you okay. buy a token on Royal, you, you were buying ownership in the song. That is in a way, you know, that ownership is to me more meaningful as it applies to buying the song as art um, because it's a different medium. Um, I actually don't like at Royal, we do want to enable people to buy music as art, but it all, but the participation piece is instrumental. And that's just the structure of the music business, by the way, like this is, this is very much informed by like how the, the how IP flows in music is mm -hmm. very different than visual arts. And so the idea that like buying music for like, for the fact that it is art is still an amazing idea. Um, the, the problem you run into again is clearances um, and that doesn't scale, right? So it works for independent artists who have had a hard time earning streams. And so collectible music is, is interesting in so far as it's basically like a donation to the artist in a way. It's like patronage and proving that you found that artist first, which sure. is which are both value propositions that we capture at Royal um, just without the audio file, which the audio file itself is what makes collectible audio impossible to scale. The second you have one other writer on a song um, who hasn't given you explicit permission to issue that audio, um, you're fine. you can't do it. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like living proof of this. And, 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 you know, there's a lot of context that I have on this. Um, so for independent artists, collectible audio is extremely interesting. Like, but ultimately you're just trading, you know, the way that secondary flows, it, it's like a user shows patronage for that collectible audio and then they just trade their patronage. 
they don't but they don't have any re- they don't actually own anything i think sure. the narrative is wrong like when you own a music nft that is all you do you just own it it's like owning a cd on the blockchain which is cool but not at the price points that it's happening for right um so in my mind what we do at royal is really special because it's the combination of both you actually get the upside of all the ip that exists in web 2 like an ip law unfortunately will will persist to exist in web 2 for a while um it's not as simple as people snap their fingers and put all this D- drm on chain um most independent artists probably would benefit from a publishing administrator even though it's a legacy actor they collect on your behalf when anyone else uses your music in a web 2 in the web 2 world if you have a publishing administrator and you issue an nft with the song you need to get clearance from your own admin like these are like problems that i don't think anybody's really thinking about that i've run into personally and it just doesn't scale so i do think collectible audio is interesting um it's again trading patronage being first but there's no inherent scarcity it's invisible the consumption layer is the same as a streaming service and i'm not really sure what you're buying Mm. um so because no one's been able to tell me you know the only thing people say is you're buying music as art and you haven't been able to do that before i don't know how much i buy that in the sense that um music is definitely art but if you really think about buying it as art why why should that matter is it synthetic right Is, is that idea synthetic um and and i think for me at least personally the answer is yes however when you think about one of ones that are collectible for songs Mm -hmm. that resonates a little bit more to me because there's only one of them and like that's super interesting in that it's like the ultimate form of patronage right as opposed to a thousand people um and that kind of patronage is it's literally just a donation to the artist. There's there's nothing. There's no ownership, real really. But I I can I can kind of go through this for a while. I guess my question to you is, you know, what do you feel like when you you said you have a collection of music NFTs? Um, do you spend time listening to that collection over and over again, or when you're in the car, like in the car, are you listening to your collection of music, or are you using another streaming service? Great question. I can't listen to my music NFTs. The consumption layer for music collectibles doesn't exist yet. There's no way for me to really connect my wallet to something for it to populate my music NFTs, for me to download them offline and to enjoy them if I'm on the plane, for example. It doesn't exist yet, right? Now, to say whether it's going to exist, if someone's working on it, probably. Does it matter? Does it, does it, need, does it even need to exist, I think? Is so if, if artists end up doing Web3 native releases and drops where they only submit their material on, on chain, right? And they ignore the entire Web2 element. Not on chain. The collectibles, the music the NFTs. Audio, audio is not on chain. So That's maybe I'm thinking about it wrong. So explain it to me. So well, how, well, does, it, how does it work myth. from an infrastructure level then? This is the myth. This is okay. the myth. Um, I invested in Arpeggi because the actual samples are on chain, and I think okay. that's really fucking cool. Um, your NFT just points to IPFS or Arweave with an audio file posted up. Like, who? It, it's just like anything else. The the NFT is just a certificate. It's like, and, and by the way, you know, I did this for a really long time, right? I, I did audio visual collectibles, and um, now I'm actually assigning ownership to all of those previous collectors. Okay, um, true ownership, um, and and that was kind of always my vision from day one. Um, you know, I, I, I'm happy to be very real about my opinion here. I don't think I've been too public about this, but you know, I've individually done over $25 million of volume for collectible music, audio, music. like that's more than the entire market of collectibles, yeah. uh, as it is today, like by miles. Yeah. And I think that that's not the way. Um, why? Yeah. Because I, again, think like collectibles are a great way for independent artists to monetize. And I think that's super powerful. And I would never want to take that away from anybody. If there are buyers for that, great. I don't think the mainstream will care because ultimately the consumption layer will always be a streaming service. Even if it's Audius or a Web2 streaming service at Royal, you capture both. Like, Audius doesn't have monetization in- enabled today. I'm an, I, I'm an original Audius advisor. When they do enable monetization, your rights as a token holder still extends to a Web3 consumption service. So people are like, why are you doing this? Thing with streaming rights if it's dependent on the web 2 world no you actually get to participate in any income that happens in the web 3 world too in fact an artist could 
theoretically assign a royal token ownership in like future collectible editions of itself. Mm -hmm. and, and like there's infinite kind of ways you can you can frame it, but owning rights is the core value prop of Royal. Sure. And I only came to after a year and a half of experience dealing with the IP side of things that I will be very, you know, forthcoming about. No one else has dealt with the way I have. Um, it's intense. And we're gonna I'm gonna tell some of those stories yeah. in this blog post. But even if I own the complete master of something, if somebody wrote a couple words and they own 7% of the publishing, you need to clear that before you upload and exploit that audio. And that just doesn't scale. That means every artist that releases collectible audio needs to either have an agreement in place, which in some cases, like a new agreement in place for a new song with a split. Um, but this whole myth of splits is also kind of weird. Like you can create splits on chain, but that's not enforceable anywhere else outside of the or originating minting contract in terms of right. what happens. It's so like right. this whole splits thing is kind of mythical as well. And that, you know, let's say you only release a song in Web3 and you have this split contract, but then somebody else goes and exploits your song and uses it on YouTube. You don't capture that. Right. And anybody can do that. So it's actually almost dangerous, I think, um, because Web2 still exists. We can't ignore it. Yes, you can create a Web3 native artist. Like Snoop had this, you know, did this NFT with this mix. He's like, you can, if you own one, you could do whatever you want with it. I mean, he like that. I don't know what that means. Right. Does that mean I can, go, can I go buy one, upload it to Spotify, <laughs> do a remix of it and like monetize it? That I mean, if I did that, what would happen? Right. Yeah. I, like that's kind of crazy. Like I could, I could do that, but I don't know if I could do that. So it's unclear. Right. I think what we do at Royal, it's really interesting is we make, we make it as clear as possible. And today we, we only support um, streaming specific royalties um, for new artists, I've done full master ownership with my previous works. Um, and then in the future, like artists will be able to sell whatever they want, whatever, whatever ownership they maintain in a song mm -hmm. or writer mm -hmm. who's Royal who might not even own, might not even be a featured artist yeah. on the song. They can sell their writer share if they want. It's, it's the flexibility and scalability that we really care about. The second you intersect, the second the audio comes into play, it's your point of failure. So you asked me earlier, why do I collect music NFTs? Like, what's the point if there's no ownership attached to it? Okay. Again, for me, I look at it, whether or not the audio file lives on chain or on Arweave or IPFS, the collectible still sits in my wallet, right? If I go to OpenSea and I, I can play that song through OpenSea. And it's so proof on, of patronage. Pro proof of patronage, sure. But the way I kind of think about it, and correct me if, if my mental model is wrong, I live through the era, era of one seeing your drop in Clubhouse being able to get one of those like participation NFTs for not ma making it a top 33, right? I got one of those. I saw Beeple's drop. I saw the era of Nifty Gateway. I saw the era of Super Rare. I saw a lot of these Instagram and corporate artists that otherwise weren't making jack shit off their craft, later transition that talent to crypto, to NFTs. And then a few months later, ended up in Christie's, ended up in Sotheby's, et cetera. That's a lot of me like capturing those data points and trying to see, will that history kind of apply to the music artists, right? So from, from a creator's point of view, if I have the ability to support that artist, right, and, and give them patronage based off the price point that I can afford, amazing because it's a win-win. And if that artist ends up continue innovating in Web3, they open a DAO, they issue a governance token, they tie all that value back to their collectors somehow, that's something that I believe might happen, right? And I'll take that bet if it's a 0.1 ETH, if it's a 1 ETH bet, right? That's how I kind of see it. So maybe it's not so much on like the IP ownership, more so on the patronage side of things, but I think there's, I think at some point there's, there's value in both, but I'm really curious to I like, wonder, I wonder okay. how big the audience is. Okay. That's, that's my, that's my ultimate kind of question. Because that, that's my question to you too. Like do consumers, do, do retail investors care about owning a song one or collecting a, a, an NFT, like a music NFT? Like, is that embedded in, in like the, the nature of a human, right? Yes. And I'll tell okay. you, kind of, here's, here's an example I can give you there's kind of two ways to think about this, right? Um, this proof of patronage model doesn't need the audio file to exist or the, or the tokenized audio to matter. So what I mean by that is like, if an artist issued a bunch of tokens that were like proof of patronage and that proved you were the first person to listen to that artist and it didn't include the audio, you remove all of the friction points on the on the IP regu regulatory side, 
Mm -hmm. And it does the same thing because you're not, again, you don't listen to your collectibles, um, really, right? You, you collect them to support the artist. Correct. But the failure point is the audio. So if somebody just wanted to create badges of, you know, badges of um, patronage, I actually think that's kind of interesting in and of itself. Um, and again, my my mental model around this is all like based on failure points, not based on like the thesis, right? Which is like buying music as art is probably interesting. It's just that you can't really scale that. Um, the next question is, um, how much do people care? Which is what you were asking. Right. And I, I was just in Austin. Our offices, the royal offices are in Austin. And I was looking at a new apartment and the realtor, probably 43 year old guy, asked me, you know, what are you doing in Austin? I'm like, started this company called Royal. He said, what do you do? I said, Royal enables anyone to invest in music and own music. And he said, oh, so like, does that mean I could own like a piece of Freebird? Like it immediately, res I didn't say yeah. anything about crypto or NFTs, like none of that. Like you can own a piece of your favorite music. He's like, I, I understand that. Yeah. Like I own a piece of Freebird and by Leonard Skinner. I'm like, yes. He's like, you know, he asked, is it, is it like a music, you know, is it a music market, right? Like a, like a music stock market. And we're like, not really. Um, but, but ultimately it resonated immediately with this guy that he could have an emotional, like real and emotional ownership in something that's meaningful to him without having to use the word NFT or collectible. Right. Um, and honestly, like that's it. Right. I get like, that. Yeah. like if we want to onboard the next, like OpenSea still has just above a million users. Like that's, that's unbelievable. And I'm an OpenSea investor and I'm a huge supporter. And I think that they're, they're building incredible things. But if we want to onboard the masses to this technology, you have to use framing that makes sense to them. And when you own something, the word own literally means etymologically having control authority over then ownership with that suffix ship adds the word, adds the framing of legal tender to the meaning. Um, we think legal tender is pretty important for music ownership. Mm -hmm. Board Apes did this with, I mean, I mean, the most successful project of all gave you real ownership in the IP. I think that says something. I think that says a lot. In fact, that's probably why I minted Apes in the first place when they originally minted. Because Ben, um, my friend Ben Milstein was like, dude, you've been talking about this IP thing and this is the first visual project that gives you rights to the IP that's really powerful. I was a crypto punk maxi and then like then they fucking bought larva labs i mean like it like on, like my thesis from back then is all playing out um i wrote about it it's documented not to like not to pull a egotistic i was right <laughs> I, I don't know yet but like it kind of was i mean and i think i think that like i just i just truly believe that the speculative activity around a lot of this air is interesting and fine. And I even engaged in it for a while, but then abandoned it because I felt that something more real needed to be built because to let like most people, like you understand the idea of tradable patronage, manifesting support for an artist early in their career. The idea that like someone else might want to pay a higher price um, to, you know, support that artist buying music as art is a very, very, very interesting thesis, but music is a different kind of art. Sure. Visual. You can't manifest something that doesn't or that behaviorally doesn't already exist. So one thing that my co-founder and I talk a lot about is, you know, my favorite band in the world is Radiohead. And if Radiohead created a one of one physical platinum vinyl of In Rainbows, I would bid like crazy to fucking win that thing. OK. But if they made like 100 of them, I'd probably pay for it. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd pay for it. Like physical. I'm talking about like physical platinum right. vinyl. They made a thousand of them. I wouldn't care, you know. Um, I, I I think it's it's just kind of a behavioral thing where, and that's like something physical that I can hang up on my wall. Right. Um, how is a regular consumer going to distinguish between listening to a song on Spotify and owning a music NFT? I mean, there's literally no difference. The difference with the visual is like with a PFP specifically, you you're the only one with that fucking image, at least for apes and for, for some of these, then right. with, the art, with the art prints, like, yeah, there might be a hundred, but I could put it up on my wall and I can say, I own that when someone's in my house, which I do. I have a lot of visual, I have a lot of visual art NFTs, way more than PFP NFTs. I actually love the visual art NFTs because I can do something with it. With music, I can play you my audio NFT. I could go on one of these websites and play it for you over my Sonos when you're in my house. 
and I can say, ah, I, I own this, but you don't, you, you own an NFT of it. It's like when you're walking down the street, here's, here's the best example. And I'll leave it yeah. at this. I was walking down the street with, with our, with our marketing director um, and close friend of mine, Kevin in Austin by our office. And my song, is it love? The one I brought up earlier um, came on, on the, like uh, we were passing this bar and Kevin was like, you know, why I love Royal. I'm like, why? He's like, would I brag to you about having the CD of this in, in the nineties? If we, if we had the same experience in the nineties, would I brag to you about like having the CD of this song? No, that behaviorally never would have happened. But today I can brag to you and say, I actually own a piece of this song. That's a way more meaningful social experience. And I would liken collectible audio to owning the CD of something. I don't think it's any different behaviorally with art, right? It's a, it's a different medium. Music is invisible. Art is tangible. So I think all these different mediums, when you think about like what's going to be tokenized and what isn't and how it's going to be tokenized, you can't apply the same scarcity model to every type of media. It just doesn't work. Um, and so for me, at least, enforceable scarcity with real ownership gets me excited. Now, the people like think about the royalty layer and like how much are you actually going to make? Um, the answer is we don't know. Like if a song yeah. explodes, it works. If a song doesn't, it doesn't. We right. think making everyone, giving everyone the ability to be their own record label is incredibly powerful. And that's not to say that I, I think record label DAOs are a whole other equation and that gets very, very interesting. And, you know, there's a lot of really interesting things I think that will happen there. But for us at Royal, we just want to make it really easy for somebody to understand. You like this TikToker and, and her music. She's huge. And for 25 bucks, you can own the song. And if she grows in popularity significantly, those royalties might be significant. They might not. But the actual underlying value of the asset, there's something intrinsic there. We price all of our assets um, with a model that that considers all the actual value from the Web2 world because that's the only place the value is manifesting. Um, and I think synthetic value is kind of dangerous. It, 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 there are only like 5,000 people doing this right now. Uh, it's so small. It's so and small. Royal has almost a million users of people that are waiting to buy things. Not all of them are crypto native. So that should that should say something, I think. Right? I think I think that should say something in that like people understand what it means to own versus collect. And there there is a difference. And at least with an ape, I own it. Now with my punk that I love forever, I own it. I really do. I do whatever the fuck I want with it. Right. That's awesome. You own a music entity there, you can't do shit with that thing. But like right now, you said you're going to transfer rights. So you're going to do some type of IP uh, uh, mixture to kind of provide some type of royalty to your previous NFT music collectors. Is that what you said? Oh, yeah. Did you say so, something like that? Okay. So it's already so, happening. Okay. So talk talk more about that because can't technically an artist who just issued collectibles do a variation of that and, and apply that IP? How, or am I thinking about this wrong? Of course they could. Okay. Of course they could. They need the tools to do that. Okay. And, 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 and is that a limiting factor right now? I guess that requires a lot of money. It's something that you went through, right? And I asked um, this from a very dumbed down point of view because- No, no, no. This is a great, that's an amazing yeah. question. Um, yes. Um, you can assign anything to previous things that you've minted. Okay. I think that's cool. I think people should do that. In fact, at Royal, we're building, um, I can't speak too much about this, but you're going to be able to plug into anything you've ever minted and do stuff on Royal, whether you've minted an asset with Royal or not as an artist. Um, Sick. we're building some really, really cool tools for artists that we think, you know, tools that I would want as an artist, right? I, I like, I, I kind of, I'm building Royal in, in, in the vision of the future that I see as a musician and all the tools that I want. But just as you said, you know, I released a bunch of NFTs last March, unreleased music. We finally released them on Spotify and I literally gave away hundred percent of the ownership to the holders. And they're going to have like, now the songs, the songs are out, they're generating income, not significant. Right. But they, they are generating income and those holders will get paid. They own it. They actually all own the song together. I don't even own it anymore. Hmm. Do the and participation really trophies get anything? <laughs> the one that participated in the iconic drop. So actually, we did. My little brother included that on the whitelist for his project, which okay. was really cool. But these things are on chain and there's now proof that you did that back then. And I can do whatever. Like it should be every artist's intention to reward those who supported you early. That's the one thing about patronage that I do think is cool. Mm. Like proving that patronage is very valuable. 
Um, but to get this stuff to the masses, I think it's just a different equation. Now, you own you you said you own that participation in NFT. Like, there's not much I can say here, but I can say like obvious obviously at some point in time I'm gonna want to reward everybody who's ever supported me. And um those participation NFTs are quite meaningful and will probably have really cool utility in the future that I'm planning. But again, you know, a lot of the stuff that I wanted to do a year ago is finally almost ready today. You know, it took yeah. a year. It took yeah. a year building a team at Royal, like basically building all the tools that I wanted as an artist to execute on. Um, and, and again, I should say, I've been a little bit aggressive in this conversation about collectible audio. I actually think that for independent artists, it's really powerful and it helps them monetize. It helps them survive. And I think there's that's all positive. It just doesn't scale, which is not the business I want to be in. Right? I want to be in a business of changing the world. I don't want to be in a business of a, 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 a niche business of, you know, donation, like patronage on chain for small artists. Super interesting. But if you, but everything we do at Royal captures that and there's economic upside. Right. Like betting on Billie Eilish before she becomes Billie Eilish, that's a fucking real serious yeah. investment. That's yeah. awesome. Right. Um, so, yeah. That's a lot of the conversations. I don't know if you remember, but about a year and a half ago on Blockchain and Booze, it was you uh, and Cooper. We were talking about music NFTs, right? It's actually the most watched episode of, oh, really? of Blockchain and Booze, funny enough. Yeah. yeah and we, and we, we, we talked about basically like what if you can invest in an artist and provably invest, right, and support an artist prior to them becoming huge and ride that success with them, right? It's a lot of the mental model that I kind of used to understand from that point on how these things are going to change the world from my point of view. What's up, guys? Adam Levy here. Sorry for the quick pause. I wanted to give some love to our two NFT sponsors that are making this episode a reality. They are Coinvise and Polygon Studios. On Coinvise, you can create a personal or community-owned social token on Ethereum or Polygon. Coinvise also helps you create incentives through token rewards and bounties, NFT business models, and bot integrations for Discord. Discover more today by visiting coinvise.co. Polygon Studios is the gaming and NFT arm of Polygon, who's focused on growing the blockchain gaming and NFT industry while bridging the gap between Web 2 and Web 3 gaming. The Polygon Studios ecosystem comprises highly loved blockchain games like OpenSea, Upshot, Avagachi, Zed Run, Skyweaver, Decentraland, and Decentral Games. If you're a gamer, builder, or NFT creator looking to join the Polygon Studios ecosystem, get started today by visiting polygonstudios.com. All right, back to the episode. I want to talk to you about also like the the value frameworks. Like how, what traits go into valuing uh, an ownership-based music NFT? Right now, we just have the Web2 world, okay. unfortunately. Plus, there's like an emotional premium that we're going to, as we collect more data points, um, we're going to find out like we're going to like pricing is we're in this like crazy price discovery mode for like, how does the, like, we still think at Royal, we're selling music as art. It's just not the song. And the reason why we exclude the song is because we never, we don't believe NFTs will be the consumption layer of music ever. Mm. Um, so we protect ourselves from IP specific things. We enable scale. You're still buying ownership in the song, which is art and you have visual art to represent that ownership. Um, but the pricing is, is right now, modeled after you know web two based income not gonna lie um what's cool about it is in secondary it's trading way above that that's the emotional value difference but i'd love to let the market price that sure why sure. not let the market price the difference that's what i've always done with my token sales when i did that auction for ultraviolet they could have ended up at 50k and still like there was no pricing it was, the market decided now the market was crazy <laughs> i i still to this day think it's not <laughs> <laughs> um, but you bet all those people will, 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 you know, some of them have already, you know, gotten amazing utility. Two of those collectors came backstage with me at EDC this past year. That was part of their perks. They had like the best time ever, you know, like there's real value there. But again, letting the market value the emotional difference between reality of ownership and, and Web3 ownership, I think is really important. Can we reminisce for a minute on that drop? Uh, that was the most <laughs> iconic drop ever. I remember that was in the prime of the clubhouse era. And it was a bridge between the website that you had, which was like a first of its kind type of minting site backed by Origin Protocol. And then clubhouse of just like this emotion, this energy of like switching between my phone tabs from clubhouse to my Chrome, uh, my Google Chrome tab and seeing how everything was fucking escalating in real time. You coming on clubhouse crying 
your parents coming on yeah. screaming, your grandparents on like it was like a whole freaking it was insane. It, it was, was absolutely insane. It was it that was point cool. where I was like, shit, like what is going on here? <laughs> like that was <laughs> it was it was the first time, you know. Um, you know, people people ask all the time, like how, why, you know, it's just a combination of inputs, the design of the auction. Yeah. It being on my own website, not having a partner, like that was so risky. I that was like I was scared shitless. I was like, what if this shit doesn't sell? It's like it has to be people that come for me. Like there's no platform emails. There's you know, it's all right. me, right? And like there's no no other way to cut it. And you know, the reason why it did well is I think just because of the history, you know, me trying a lot of this stuff five years ago. Yeah. Um with poaps at, at a crypto music festival, right? Like that's how this all manifested. But that was a really emotional moment. And it kind of set my brain into this crazy i mean it's still running from from then it's it's been a year and it doesn't stop it's like how do you how do you scale what happened that day to everybody there's there's got to be a way to do that like it shouldn't just be me who gets to do this every artist should get to do this yeah and that's really the inspiration behind royal is like what will the map what will the mainstream be interested in um not what what are crypto people interested in I think there's like, there's a big discrepancy and, uh, you know, we do have to onboard the next many users. Yeah. You know, back to the point of how do you like value an ownership based music NFT? You talked about like the web two data. Can you go more in depth as to what, what is, what is, what is web two data? Is it like aggregating all streaming, uh, uh, plays, right? Like what, what kind there's, of metrics go into there's that? streams, there's syncs, there's pup PROs. There's okay. so right now we're only supporting streaming ownership, but like okay. some of my stuff is full ownership. Okay. Um, you know, people on in the in the kind of music NFT on music NFT Twitter often compare like the valuation of a song as an NFT to the streams that it would take to generate that much money. It's such an unfair comparison because you're talking about charitable donations versus capitalism. Like, it's just not the same. Mm -hmm. um, I'm willing to bet you that not every fan like there are still very few people that are willing to buy this stuff at mass. Like I couldn't, I might've sold, you know, I might've streamed my music over a billion times, um, which is true across, across platforms. I may have sold over half a million tickets in my life. Um, but getting those people to just like collect a song for $200 for a hundred, 200, whatever it is, uh, $300. Um, that's hard. It's like a hard sell to them. It's hard to sell people merch. Right. Most musicians don't even really make that much money in merch. Only the top guys do. So, you know, thinking of this, treating it as it is an investment um, with real intrinsic value is powerful. Um, but you asked, I feel like I got away from the question, which was the specific like the, question. The, 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 value value? the value frameworks, right? So you it's, talked it's, about like the streaming data, right? And looking at that, for example, right? And then mul multiplying the cash flows on an annual basis. Got it. Got it. And then we let and then we let the secondary market price the emotional value in. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Well, like a song, right? That we're doing. Um, yeah. It's priced based off based off of a model that takes into account all of his other streaming performances. Uh, the stream the streaming performance of his other music, the trajectory of this song, and like there's payouts for this these levels of ownership. And the more ownership you buy, like the diamond token has a little bit better, like. You know, as you can tell, like pr price dollar per, per per ownership is different. Mm -hmm. um, you go up in the tiers, and then the benefits also change, right? And you get more benefits being a you know right. diamond holder. So, so kind of so there's patronage, of there's patronage utility, and like you said, there's also the ownership IP era. It's per layer it's, of utility. Yeah. Exactly, it's both. It's yeah. both, and we think that's so important. We think it. We think both matter. Yeah. Um, one over the other is difficult to is difficult to see, um, but we've got some crazy data where, you know, we did this artist Ollie and after his drop, the actual stream counts escalated because incentives are now aligned. When you own a, when you own a music NFT um, as a collectible, you're going to tell your friends about that artist, but there's nothing they can do to, a, to accrue value to the artist that you bought into, right? Like you own this music NFT. They might go like, listen to that, that musician more on Spotify or on Audius or wherever they do. It doesn't really add value to your music NFT unless someone else wants to buy it. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Royal, you're an owner. You tell your friends about a song. That actually adds value to everybody. 
instantly the second you do it. So the alignment of incentives is something we think is really powerful with real ownership that doesn't really exist with collectible ownership. The same, like, again, this is different for visual art than it is for music. Um, with visual art, you tell somebody about your favorite artist and they might want to go buy the next NFT from them, whether that's Beeple or Thank You X or Fuck Render. Um, with music, the second the song is done, uh, the second you own the song, like, yeah, maybe that person will buy like the next song from that artist, but it doesn't influence the performance of the, of, of the one that you actually bought, which I think is ultimately, and, and that performance actually kind of matters, right? For an artist's popularity. So um, it, it's a weird, it's a weird mind maze when you start thinking about this stuff. But again, behaviorally, there's history, there's historical precedent for prints being valuable to humans. Prints, like physical prints. My JD owns, uh, my co-founder owns a Dali, I think a Dali print. That's one of a hundred. There's like historical precedent for that kind of value. Multitude of physical art. There's historical precedent for uniqueness in one of one art. And in many ways, PFPs are one of one insofar as you have your own unique visual as a part of a collective of 10,000. So there's like historical precedent for these behaviors in the physical art world. There's no historical precedent for buying music as art. So we can imagine what that world might look like. But if you're dependent on the IP of the legacy world, it's it's hard to. And, and like, again, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot here, but I did it and it didn't work. It didn't work mm -hmm. in so far as, you know, I, you know, had to deal with the IP consequences of that auction. And I did, and, and it's all good now. But mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of people that were like, how do we even value this? Like what percentage of this sale should be attributed to me as a writer in the song? And like there was no there was no precedent for that. So, you know, some people might negotiate that up front for collectibles, but again, there's no historical manifestation of that behavior. With with ownership in music, there is. So, like our thesis at Royal is if you make something that rich people already do accessible to everyone, that's probably a good model for a startup. Um, that's like our thesis that JD and I share. Like music ownership is limited to record labels and to private equity firms. We open that up to everyone. The fact that we do it with with NFTs is irrelevant, right? right. Like that's right. part of it. That, yeah. that that should never be the center, right? Of of a value proposition. Um, you have to kind of lean into existing behavior. Uber did this. Airbnb did this. Uber's like it. Calling a cab is fucking annoying, and there's lots of cars and people that are probably willing to drive you around everywhere. You just have to get over the fact that there's a stranger that's going to drive you that in that place. And if you do, this is way more efficient, right? Yeah. But like the behavior already existed buying music as art is, is, is just something i can't really wrap my head around on a, on a core level but on a patronage level i can okay that's where i think things really do work and so you know it'll be interesting to see how everything manifests over time but at royal our goal is to capture all of it right like all of it without any of the risks and max scalability Makes sense. Can we talk about the limited digital asset <clears throat> that's unique to Royal? Um, what is an LDA? The LDA, I remember, is something that was very revolutionary and iconic to Royal's brand leading up to the launch. And now with every single drop, you make all the legal paperwork like very transparent. You, you let users know what they're getting into, which is amazing. But for those who don't understand the legality, what is an LDA? How do you make sense of it? How can the everyday user kind of understand it? Just take it away. So an LDA is you know technically they, they're nfts we just think that it's more approachable because um nfts to most regular people carry all this emotional baggage of like okay. environmental things and this and that um we just say you know with the limited with this limited digital asset you as a royal user own a piece of this song you own music you actually do and then we publish the legal agreement that assigns you whatever rights are associated with the contract minting address and the token ids and, and so on and so forth mm -hmm. and then the artist is obligated to, you know, assign the assign and, and and upkeep those rights that you own in the song. And Royal is just a platform to enable it. It's like think about eBay or you know even Amazon third party sellers. Um, you know these are platforms where buyers and sellers come together. That's what we want Royal to be for artists and fans. Shared ownership, a platform for shared ownership. So so LDAs are essentially just like our like I don't want to call it proprietary. It's just like the way that we think about these assets because they okay. are assets um 
versus tokens, which like most people don't really understand tokens. They start thinking social token, DAO token, NFT. Like these are real assets with real rights attached to them that also have additional, you know, token gated benefits or, you know, LDA gated benefits, right? And that benefits portal that we're building will be ready soon. And that will also enable, you know, we're, we're like, I can't speak too much about that, but we're just excited to kind of like unlock all the value propositions that people have been preaching in the media. So LDAs are really just um, rights in a song plus visual art that represents those rights. Got it. And it's really simple. Got it. So actually, how did it come to the formation of an LDA? Like what's the story behind forming this thing? Because from what I understand, there wasn't some type of legal vehicle that supported a lot of the thesis and the energy that you wanted to bring to Royal, right? Mm -hmm. So can you talk more about like the origin story of forming the LDA? Because I feel like a lot of what people know Royal for beyond patronage, beyond the ownership is that ability to kind of not bypass, but find a way to actually do it at least the right way, right? To, to do these ownership things the right way. So talk to me more about the formation of the LDA. What were you, I guess, trying to achieve with it that you couldn't achieve with other legal formats um, and kind of around that? Yeah, and so, you realize that I'm even having a hard time quite asking yeah, it is, because I, I don't even understand what the hell it is from a, from a very like technical point I of mean, view, right? It's just it's really just a data point. I, I think it's 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 quite simple. It's like I do agreements with vocalists and all these other people on songs, and I have an accounting firm that calculates royalties and sends them out to these people. And if I died tomorrow, God forbid, all these people would still get paid because of the way copyright law works, and that's probably important. Um, and the idea is like, an LDA is really simple. It makes you a collaborator in the song. Even though you didn't contribute anything creatively to it, it actually makes you uh, an owner, a collaborator with your favorite artist in a song. We think that's like so incredibly powerful. Um, and the legal framework surrounding that is, the song has to already exist. Um, you as an artist, can sell whatever ownership you maintain in that song as you would in the real world, right? So people sell catalog, all the Bob Dylan, you hear Bob Dylan sold his catalog for $300 million. Like who are the buyers of that? Well, hedge funds, private equity, right? Um, and I think Bruce Springsteen did it recently, right? So all these activities are happening in the real world. Um, we're just extending them to the public. And then the reason why we built this stuff on chain is because it's actually like way more efficient to send micropayments um, on an L2 or, you know, when people might make you know ten dollars a month or fifteen dollars a month, or maybe they don't make anything, um, we just wanted the infrastructure to exist so that that was possible um, for you know so that the gas claim wasn't as much as the payout, right? And mm -hmm. you know sometimes like just just as with venture capital or seed investing, like not every song someone buys is going to explode, but it still has emotional value to you. I think that's what's so powerful is like combining both real ownership and emotional value and patronage is to me like. It captures all potential venues for success as we bring this stuff to the, to the mainstream. So, you know, a lot of this activity, again, I, I, I love like Web2 behavioral models because you just project them skeuomorphically on Web3 and things start to get, make sense. Like patronage already happens in Web2, buying merch. It's really like the number, physical merch is like probably the number one method of like true patronage. Um, you extend that into Web3, and it's interesting. There just hasn't been that much demand for it yet. Um, and I'm not sure when or if or how that will happen for merch, for digital merch. Um, but there's already demand for rights ownership. It's just inaccessible to the public. We use Web3 to make it accessible to the public. That's kind of the mental model that I went through with, with Royal yeah. um, to kind of establish the LDA framework. But an LDA is, you know, we call it a limited digital asset because that's exactly what it is. Um, we don't like using the word NFT because we think it confuses the public. It does. Um, when I talk about Royal, people ask, what is Royal? I say it enables you to own your favorite music. I don't say you can own an NFT of your favorite song. I, I mean, there's, there's just a huge difference when you say that to somebody. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the origins of LDAs. Um, Got it. but I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there, but, um, I'm also going to publish this blog post soon that goes really deep in, okay. in a lot of this stuff. Got it's it. easier to write than to say. I feel like I repeat myself a lot. So I apologize for all of you watching this episode if I repeated myself too much. No, no, it's it's all good. I think the more context, the better. Does the does the LDA change for every single drop? Is it tailored per artist? There's so much coming in that department that I can't talk about yet. But okay. they're all currently from the same minting contract. Got it. Um, for a lot of reasons. But 
um, mainly for a new user to not have to set approvals every time they want to sell something um, based on how we're building it. Because when we when you don't have a wallet and you buy an LDA with a credit card, we generate a wallet for you. It's like really, really cool backend technology that mm -hmm. abstracts the blockchain completely, which we think is important. But we want the flexibility of being able to withdraw and control yeah. yourself. Sure. Um, it's very much inspired by Nifty Gateway. Um, and and for for me, at least, there's a really healthy balance between OpenSea and Nifty that like at Royal, we're, we're really exploring heavily. I want to talk to you about price psychology, okay? And how artists and, and creators should be thinking about basically, how does one actually go by determining the price of a song? I remember Verte released a blog post saying that she lets basically an open bid structure to kind of determine, let the market decide what they want to collect a song for, buy a song for. How do you know whether to buy something for a dollar, fifty dollars, four thousand dollars? And I guess that it's different in the ownership context, right? Because it is. You, it's completely different. Market pricing is always a good model. The problem is there just isn't enough liquidity or data there. To, there's like no price discovery mechanism for collectibles. And my auction is proof of that. I, I openly say that. The market did price that. Um, so that is the emotional value. Like whether we like it or not, the market set that emotional value. Right. Um, so I think Verite is right in that. She and I are very close friends. It doesn't surprise me that we agree. Um, I also think that with ownership, um, there is more of a rigid framework for valuation. The beauty is what's happening in between, capturing the emotional value unlock that this Web2 world hasn't yet. And at Royal, we want to enable that, but not force it down people's throats in that there is a limited number of people that are going to spend money on a you know, collectible piece of music today. They're, they're native crypto users. It's a small audience. With a larger audience, how is that price discovery going to change? It's going to either go in one direction or the other, but it's going to be way, 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 way more powerful. I mean, we've seen that with all types of tokens, not just NFTs, right? Like all, like ETH went down to $88 two, three years ago. Yeah. Look at how powerful it is today, right? Yeah. Like there's the, the markets are inherently speculative when they first start. So for collectibles, it will always be speculative. And, and to be honest, like that's most of the behavior. At Royal, we're, we're, we're excited to, like while we know that some of the secondary is going to be speculative, we want to let that happen naturally and build in true ownership. So, you know, the prices that we post are, are relative to a pricing model that like considers income related to the song, we, it, as it should be. Um, then there's, you know, the artist has a choice in what they want to price things. And there will be a day that we don't sell out a drop on Royal because an artist will price things too highly. And while we will advise artists, we will never tell them what to do. Sure. Um, it's ultimately a platform for artists. So, so there is going to be a day that somebody prices something too high and it doesn't sell out. And that's actually great. I think that sets an example for, for other artists. And I think what's happening in collectible land is the supply is just so limited. And at the same time, there's only like 10 or 12,000 people that even are, are buying these collectibles. There's not enough data to price anything. It's just not enough volume for yeah. the market, market. So at Royal, we're excited to explore what that looks like in the millions of users. Um, and the only way to do that is by abstracting crypto. So I have one final question for you. I know we're running out of time here. Okay. Um, and it's a question that I tend to ask specific guests. So I'd love to hear your take on it. Okay. I'm a big fan of the evolution of the internet. Web one was very much like read only and got taken over by web two. Web two is very much read and write and allowed us to con kind of contribute content, interact with others on the web. And now we're transitioning into what we believe or what we coin to be web three, the read, write and ownership era of the, of the internet, right. Powered by decentralized networks. Mm -hmm. uh, where we can basically provably own something that's digital. What do you think will essentially eat Web3? Huh. It's funny. I, ma I made a joking tweet about this the other day. Um, you know, the only thing I can conceptualize today is when everybody's walking around with a chip in their brain that just does things for them. <laughs> Um, but, uh, I, that was actually like, I was like, what does web four look like? It's literally th think it's it, it, like the internet is read, write, own web four is, I think, think do, um, where you just like automate the human mind. I, I think that's probably like, I mean, it's like, in a, like AI type stuff. I think, I think AI automation is probably web four. Okay. Uh, 
to an extent, but it like how it plugs into the other types of web. Um, I don't know. Right. I think like a world that I see is really interesting is I see something in the real world and I can buy it by thinking it like that's really fucking powerful. Um, I think that's web four. I know that sounds kind of scary, but like, I actually do think that's, that's next because if you think about like on time horizon, right. A lot of these like changes happen over about a 10 year period from web one to web two to web three. If you think about like 2032, think, think, own, think, do like it's the think that I think is going to get automated next. You remove friction of, of, of thought to action with technology. Um, that might be like too intense of an answer, but I actually think that's what I probably well, well think about it for a minute. Okay. So Bitcoin came uh, in the late kind of, or not early 2000s, right? What was it? 2009 or so, right? Around the time where Instagram and a lot of these social networks started popping off and, and coming out. And a lot of uh, what it aimed to solve is to create decentralized networks that were otherwise owned centrally, right? And were overpowered and whatnot. A lot of why Vitalik, or I guess the premise of why Vitalik kind of created Ethereum too, right? is because of the a whole entire issue, or at least that's like the meme, the issue around World of Warcraft, right? And him getting kicked off the right. game and saying like he's not able to sell his merch or whatever the hell the narrative was. And I like to think about it of like from the form of what's the what happens when we're extreme on ownership, right? Like what happens on that side? Maybe it, it, what happens when we're too extreme on decentralization? Like well, what's, what's the middle ground? Is that a right way to think about it? Um, Maybe. I mean, in the in the most extreme form of decentralization, where like governance is super decentralized and decision making happens in a decentralized way, that's all still part of Web three, right? So like, yeah. when I think about the difference between eras, it's like Web one, like if you really think about it, Web one and Web two did two things, like combined at the same time to an extent. Um, communication, information, and content is Web one and Web two. None of that was value capture value happened the same way you still pay for Mm e-commerce things online with a credit card um it unlocked new markets but it didn't change the fundamental way that humans value like ascribe and accrue value web3 changes value through ownership it changes the way we think about valuing anything really because you can now value digital things that only exist in the digital space which i think is like incredibly interesting and then you like insert metaverse insert Mm -hmm. uh you know Quest, MetaQuest devices, et cetera. Right. But like the next iteration of that isn't going to be about ownership. Like Web3 is going to cover ownership in some way, shape, or form over time. The next iteration is like, okay, well, like all of a sudden, after 70,000 years of human existence, everyone has the same information. Information asymmetry was like the biggest problem in human history before the internet. Mm-hmm. Now you eliminate that. That's insane. Then communication, right? Like being able to email someone. Right. Fuck. That's crazy. Right. And then content. You can just like consume parts of other people's lives at any moment in time. Wow, that's crazy, right? But all these things serve to connect and it's all information, right? So information becomes omnipresent for humans. Web3, ownership becomes available to anyone and frictionless value transfer, right? Was the proposition of Bitcoin, right? Even before NFTs or ETH, you could just send value wherever you want in the world without getting permission from anyone whenever you wanted to. That was super po- fucking powerful. Now we're extending on the Bitcoin thesis over time. The final frontier is is automation, at least in my yeah. mind. And I think with automation, um, it's just, again, like information, value, automation, like as steps. But I don't really know like like the extreme form of decentralization. I, I, don't, I don't know what that looks like, but it's still Web3. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when I think like Web four, I'm like, what's so crazy that's next? And it's it's literally like friction, um, yeah. real life, real life friction with AI. And I mean, I think that that's why a lot of like the billionaires in the world are exploring it. Right. It's like uh-huh. I think that is the next frontier. AI in space. We're just going to be a bunch of robots that are going to be traveling to space. And I guess just to correct myself really quick, the whole the whole comment around Bitcoin because being born because of the social networks is not a direct correlation. More so centralized networks right and the aim to make things decentralized oh, that yeah, was kind yeah. of the was, point yeah, right. two, yeah. I, I was kind of separating like the 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 disruptions that happened as different technologies emerged sure. so like sure. one web two information communication content web three decentralization value you know bitcoin still considering that as a web three tool right 
but yeah, neither are necessarily connected. Yeah. I think that's yeah. the beauty. Yeah. Justin, amazing. I have so many other questions lined up for you, but I know we're short on time. We'll have to do this again soon. Before I let you go, where can we find you? Where can we find Royal? Shout out to Diplo and the upcoming drop on Tuesday. This will come out on Tuesday. So um, where can we find, where can we learn more? Twitter at 3LAU at join underscore Royal. Um, same on Instagram. Easy, really simple. Amazing. We're excited if you decide to join our crazy little idea, <laughs> crazy little community of people. And uh, we've got a lot, a lot of awesome artists coming. So amazing. Thank you so much. We'll do this again soon. Awesome. Thanks, man. What's up, guys? If you've gotten this far, then I owe you a listener badge NFT. Go to adamlevy.io forward slash poap. That's P O A P and click the respective season. Fill out your info and I'll distribute the free to mint NFT at the end of the season. Also, please make sure to rate and subscribe to the podcast. You won't believe it, but it helps me out a ton. And finally, hit me up on Twitter at LevyChain. I want to hear what you're building, the latest crowdfund you're trying to complete, or if you just simply want to chat. If you couldn't tell already, I love talking about where crypto meets the creator economy, and it's no different if it's coming from you directly. Thank you so much for your support. It means the world, and we'll catch you on the next episode.